Okay, everybody, welcome back. We had a little bit of two-week hiatus, so holy Parshas Kitsetze. Um, very, very interesting Parsha. The Parshas Kitsetze discusses um, many mitzvot, just like all the other portions in the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy. But in the, in, we're going to discuss something in the Parshas Kitsetze that I think we can translate and we can um, ask and, and, and try to apply to daily life. So we know there's the good and the bad. We know there's the holy and there's the impure. And one of the, the, the oldest religious questions is, how does evil exist? So there's the why evil exists, but how does evil exist? If God is everywhere, and God's in control, sorry, let me put my phone on, on silent. If God's everywhere and God's in control, then how is, how is evil allowed to exist in the face of God? So, in other religions, they invented this theory that evil exists independent of God. And you got to make the choice between the good guy and, and the bad guy. Judaism rejects this notion 100%. We say it multiple times in Davide, in the concept of Ein Oid Mavade, there's no one aside from him. There is no other divine power aside from him. Okay. So, so well, is God descript, descriptionless, not good nor bad? No. God's good. He created the world. It's good. So if God's good, where did bad come from? It come from him. I mean, I guess, so you say when God's doing bad to you, but we, we also don't uh, believe in a vengeful God. So where, how does evil come to uh, exist? And, why, and, and so you say, okay, God wants us to fight, to, to fight evil. But, but if, I, if, if, let's say, putting on, learning Torah, putting on tefillin is good, and rejecting evil is bad. And we're spending so much time rejecting evil. Why waste our time with, with uh, why go reinventing the wheel, so to speak? Why we have to waste our time fighting evil? We could just do good. Right? Um, so, so, and you might, so some people say, oh, because God wants us to have a challenge. Okay, it's true. Life ha it has to be a, a, a balance of good and evil. Noted that we should have free choice. All, all that is, is is nice, but then simple evil would be good. I don't know, like stealing. It's, it, it, you know, that's the being rude to people. But do we have some evil, like you know, the lady in, in Britain who was just sent, sentenced to life in, in jail for killing all those babies? Yeah. Was that, was that all, it was all over the news. It was a nurse. She was a neonatal nurse in Manchester, England. She killed seven babies, tried to kill eight, eight more. To say she got bored, right. and and um, so that that's a whole different level of evil. So if if, if it was it was necessary, you know, for good versus bad, to so have cookies versus salad, right? Honesty versus versus stealing. But there's a whole another variety of evil out there. So why is it around? All right. So let let's let's ask. Um, yeah, the red truck versus Yankees. <laughs> right. the, let me tell you this year. <laughs> hey, you went into Fenway Park. There, you visited the hallowed grounds of the Red Sox. Yeah. yeah I, I, in order to, like my, my daughter said, in order to elevate the sparks of impurity, <laughs> to, re, to refine. Wait, which daughter was that? Sarah. Oh, Sarah. She, has a, she has such a sense of humor, she put it on her status. Going to elevate the impurity of the world. <laughs> I, I walked those very same steps. Steps that you took it's, almost it, every day for two years. It happens to be a beautiful stadium. I, I haven't been to the New Yankee Stadium, but Fenway is gorgeous. You know, I would go back. Really small, great park. All right. So, what do you think? Why does evil exist, Michael J? Why do you think evil exists? So, part of me questions: Is it is it evil, or is it us not understanding something? So you're saying if I'm, it's really not evil, just we perceive it as evil. It's like in it's like in war, you got two people, two groups that are fighting each other, and they're both praying for success. Right. And they both so say the other is evil. Right. Exactly. So is there just a greater story that's going on that we don't have privy to, and from our small vantage point, something looks evil, but it's because we can't see the whole. Right. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's not evil. It's only evil from our perspective. All right, Ira, why does evil exist? Evil exists because it comes from us. 
Okay, that means before the world, this goes back, right, to, the, to, to day number one. When Hashem created the world, the world, the world was good. We, we screwed it up. All right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Thank that means really, evil. really evil right. doesn't, e- really evil that doesn't exist. Evil, but we, we introduced it. But, okay, all right. No? Darkness is the absence of light. So it's, it's not really... It's so not, evil is the absence of goodness. Yeah. All right, okay. Coming come to Chabad for a while. Good, good answer. <laughs> it depends. It depends. <laughs> 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 On what your perspective is <laughs> right. Right. on the other guy. Right. Do Barbara, what do you think? I don't know. Um, evil is. I think you don't know about goodness unless you know about evil. Interesting. So the only way to know what's good is to have it to the contrast. I guess. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Good. Interesting stuff. All right, so this week's parsha. So this week's parsha, where wait. So what you're saying is <laughs> that it's okay to go out to murder somebody if you don't know what evil is. I mean, but you know that, to, no, to I don't. You know that one's evil. Well, if you never knew mm. that murder was bad, that's not no. It's a murder is a murder is a bad example. Oh, okay. Because every person is created in the divine image, and we all have a we all have a preclus, preclusivity against murder there's something innate that we know it's, it's bad but 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 something else right i mean some people you know they don't know they, they, they don't know any other way all right let's, let's go into it okay so in in prior classes you've we, we've learned that there are two types of anti-semites there's the pharaoh anti-semite and there's the homo anti-semite not this not not the same anti-semite at all Paro, the anti-Semite, hates the Jews because he's worried the Jews pose a threat. Now, regardless if the threat is a logical one or a realistic one, it's irrelevant. In Paro's mind, the Jews pose a threat. You see it in the text. Lest they become more numerous and they kick us out of the land. Jews are going to take over the country. Right? And, uh, it took, but there's another anti-Semite that hates the Jews because they are. It, that, that, that's an illogical hate. It's not based on anything. So the, 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 the power of this semite we can talk we can talk to. You can listen. you can show them that you know not all Jews you know, Jews are not, are not all that bad. you get to know them. but the, the latter anti Semite, there's no conversation you can have with this person because there is no, there's no reason why he hates. In this week's parsha, all the way to the end of the parsha. We are commanded to wipe, to remember, to wipe out Amalek. Amalek is the prototypical anti-Semite. Type B. Hates the Jews for no reason. Who was Amalek? Amalek was a, tr- was a grandson of, the name Amalek was a person, was a grandson of Esav. Esav had a son, Eliphaz. Eliphaz had a son, Amalek. And he lived, and he made a, a little a town for the town, a tribe. They lived in the south east of Israel. I guess Jordan, Saudi Arabia ish, around there. Mm-hmm. Of Israel. Yeah. And 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 now being a descendant of Yaakov, of, of Avram, Yitzchak, they knew that the land of Canaan was for the inheritance of the of the children of Yaakov. Their land was never up for fight so they had no reason to feel threatened by the Jews yet when the Jewish people left Egypt for no reason at all they weren't instigated they weren't confronted you know the Jewish people didn't trash them on Twitter you know make fun of their mother you know for no X. reason at all what? Geo- X. X. X right geographically yeah where was the land of Goshen and where were the Jews actually living at the time of the enslavement. Goshen's in or- Orange County, New York. It's a right. state. Yeah. 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 Exit, exit one, about exit 130 of, of the, of the ter- 17. Jersey Turnpike, right? No, yeah. uh, New York 17. New York 17, uh, oh, heading down towards New Jersey. No, yeah. no, 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 no. Yes, yeah. heading down towards. Well, yes. no, well, eh, well, I guess. <laughs> I guess you're going that way. Everything's, you're also, you're also going down to Florida. 
Anyway, the Goshen, I mean, th there's a whole discussion exactly where it is, but you have to think of it, it's in the Nile Delta. It's in that curve over there. In that, it's close, all of it is close to the Delta. All, it's all of be. the activities of, of, the, uh, of the Passover and everything else took place it's, in the Delta region. It's got to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got to okay. be. Exactly yeah. where it is. So Amalek came after the, the, the Jews that were leaving within the period of time between leaving that area and heading to the Sinai Peninsula, didn't he? Yeah, they attacked the Jewish people after the splitting of the sea. Okay, if that would put Amalek further to the to the west well, than uh, what uh, you're describing. No, no, it's not, the Jewish people didn't enter Amalek's territory. Amalek the left. Amalek came, in, in other words, yeah. he came out a long yeah. way. Yeah, 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 we're, yeah. we're talking a, yeah. a few hundred miles. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and for no reason. Okay. Just, okay. Just, and not only that, Medr says, Amalek didn't dream that he actually would win the Jewish people in battle. I mean, they couldn't have. They knew what God did to the Egyptians. The, the, the Egyptian empire was a much greater, more powerful army power than they were. They were a tribe. Egypt was an empire. You know, and, and Egypt was destroyed with the splitting of the sea. The only reason why they attacked the Jewish people because it's God's people. It's a nudnik. I mean, he had to do, tactically, he had to get behind them to, to get the stragglers. Me, I guess. Yeah. I mean, the Jewish people traveling with a massive entourage. We're talking about two and a half million people and cattle. So, the, you know, the, the, so the Rashi gives, Rashi quotes, I don't know if he made up the example, I can't remember because. It's, uh, it's the end of the sixth part. It's a long time ago. I haven't learned this Rashi in a year. I don't know if you made up the example, he quotes it from the Gemara, but the example is given that there's a boiling hot bath or a mikveh. So you, if you go n northeast, you'll understand what a boiling hot mikveh is. And, and everyone's afraid to go into the bath. This is before everyone had private showers in their house. Everyone's standing there. So one nunnik comes and jumps into the bath. Yeah, he gets burned, but he shows everybody that it's not so bad. So the Rashi says the same thing. The Jewish people were the, were the boiling hot bath. Everybody was intimidated from them after the Exodus. No one would come close. Came on Malik and attacked them, knowing he's going to get burned. But now the concept, the idea, the possibility of attacking the Jewish people was implanted in the nations. Had Amalek not attacked the Jewish people, then they would have walked waltz into Israel and everybody would just melt in, away in fear and trepidation. So our commandment, you see in text number one, our commandment is to remember a Amalek and to erase a Amalek. So which one is it? Are you erasing? Are you remembering? Are you erasing, are you remember, are you remembering what, what to erase? Are we talking about the Hillary Clinton's uh, servers over here? What's going on? All right, so look at text number two. <laughs> um, so text number two says, this is from, we're gonna have a lot of, uh, of this rabbi in tonight's classes. Aaron Alevi of Barcelona. And he says of this, God commanded us to remember what Amalek did to us. When he hurried to first to harm us, we are commanded to rouse our passions to fight him at, and to hate him. We always remember the commandment and never allow our hatred of Amalek to fade. It, it, um, that means it's our job to confront the, the, the baseless hatred of, Amal of Amalek or any anti semitic towards the Jewish people. We have to confront it head on. You can't just say, uh, it's okay. No, this, this, this cancer has to be um, rooted out. And if we can't do it, then we hope that God will uh, just, take care of it. Just uh, a, a point of interest is, if we are to erase him from our memories, why does it go from generation to generation? And once he's erased in a generation... Because Amalek is not just a person, Amalek's an idea. Is it to erase from our memory? Or to erase from everybody else's memory? Every human memory. The idea we're trying to eradicate this idea, the baseless hatred, number one, and we're going to go on to say later on, but the, we're the concept. We're perpetuating his, his I, I, name. We're right, but the idea, because we're going to see later on, but Amalek was challenging God here. Why did he attack the Jewish people? Why not attack any other people? Because the Jewish people were God's people. It was really a fight against God. And this idea, and we're going to get to a start this idea right now. This, this idea has to be, you know, you're angry or, you know, you, you don't want to do something. So you, you tell God, listen, God, you mind your own business, I'll mind my own business. 
you know, most non-observant people not doing it in spite right most people don't do things to stick it to the boss usually actually someone sent me a, a clip an instagram clip of a guy who walks into the, his, his office his office's job there's a bunch of people standing behind him with instruments and the boss is like oh what is it all the people have to leave and he, he hands the boss a, a note says i quit all of a sudden the band strikes up dah, dah, dah. <laughs> and he walks out the whole band is playing behind him <laughs> that's a way to quit you know <laughs> stick it to the man right so you know we're gonna we're, i'll bring it up now and we'll circle back to it later what's the difference between a malik and pari when Moshe comes to Parai and says that God wants to let the Jewish people go, what does Parai answer? Parai doesn't just say no. Parai first prefaces it by saying, I don't know this God, and therefore I'm not going to listen to him. What do you think about it? Mm-hmm. If I came over to you and told you, Jack told you, me to tell you to give me $10,000, so he would say, Who's I, Jack? I, 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 I don't know Jack, and I'm not giving you $10,000. <laughs> Even if I did know Jack. <laughs> right. But you think about it. You, 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 the Jewish people were slaves. They, they were backbone of the Egyptian economy. They had, they had free labor. Imagine going to a southern, southern plantation owner you know, in the 1840s. God told me, tell you, to lo- let all the black people go. Okay. I don't know your God, and I'm not letting my slaves go. Who's going to pick my cotton? Right? I mean, so Pari had to be educated. Pari doesn't have to be destroyed. Let's be educated. That's really what the ten plagues were about. The ten plagues were education for the Egyptians, not really for, so much for the Jews. More, Amalek knows exactly who God is. He doesn't need an education. He's going to show God that I know who you are, and I'm not going to listen, and, and I'm going to stick it to you anyway. That that can be. No, I'm thinking that he, uh, from his parents and his grandparents who the Malik yeah he would have known about God he knows very, very well about God yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that would have been the, the question is did, did Esau have any uh, <coughs> aside from it being an evil person did he have any uh, affinity towards God his hate was towards his relatives his hate was towards his brother his relatives his brother Right, but Esau had, we learned, one of the things we learned from Esau is how to respect your father. Mm-hmm. He had tremendous kibadav. Yeah. He loved, he honored Yitzchak. Yitzchak to him was, was, and you can imagine here, a guy who was killing, raping, and everything else, but his father was, yeah, interesting. Yeah. It says, the Gemara says by Esau, he was a rebellious Jew. He threw a mumaru. He was a yid. Which would make him like a yid. No. No, no. Well, that's right. It, it made for yid, made for many of them, so. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So here it comes. So now there's an interesting medrash that the Jewish people came to Moshe with a theological question. The, it, there's a few times in the Torah we're commanded to remember stuff. What we say six remembrances every day. Okay. Two of the six remembrances they had a problem with. A theological problem. One is you see text number three, remember Shabbos. Okay. Remember Shabbos. Why would you have a problem with that? No, 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 no. I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Oh, okay. The text number four, <laughs> text number four, they, they came and they said to Moshe, Opa, they came to said to Moshe, he said, how can we remember Shabbos and remember to destroy a Malik? They're, 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 op, they're opposites. Now, it's interesting, by the way, because we'll, we'll run through uh, text five and chart one very quickly. But it's not like these are the only two things to remember. You have text number five, it goes through the six constant mitzvahs. Every mitzvah has a time, except for the six constant mitzvahs. You see here, believe in Hashem, reject all idols, these are, see, all together, there's 12 things you gotta remember all the time. So what's, these two, these two, that, 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 that they have a problem with. So, so what is Moshe's answer? Text number six, you look at Moshe's answer, I'm running ahead here. Moshe answers them, um, he says, he says like this. He says, you can't compare a, a cup of wine to a cup of vinegar. They're both cups. This is this cup is sanctified Shabbos. This is a cup to destroy and an, an uproot the descendants of Amalek. You understand the answer? Probably not, right? 
Well, the, the only other thing is that that vinegar could have been derived from the well. We're going to get to that. Yeah, right. very good. Very good. That's where Moshe is going. All right, so why, let's, let's first get into why, why it is that the Jewish people had a problem with these two remembrances. Why these two seem to conflict with each other. What's Shabbos all about? Not, not only about saying Lechaim. And eating Cyril's challah. Open the rules about rest. Okay. I know we're looking. About sleeping rest. until noon time at least. Ceasing from work. No. All these are. <laughs> all these are a result of something else. The idea we keep Shabbos is because that we say in the Kiddush on Friday night. Shabbos is called a testimony, which means Hashem created the world in six days, and the seventh day He rested. So the belief of Shabbos is really about that God is in absolute control of the entire world. He's the master, and when He, when he says, goes. And He says, work, I work. He says, stop, I stop. But the belief in Shabbos is not just about eating challah and saying l'chaim and sleeping into whatever time. It, it's, what it's really about is it testifying of Hashem's control over the entire world. Al Cain, we say, Zachar, Sam Shabbos, Akachi, Shishi, Sam Tabit. Remember, Shabbos, six days he worked, and the seventh day he rested. Therefore, Hashem made it holy and he blessed it, and therefore, that's what we do, right? That's why the Kiddush and Shabbos uh, on Friday night, we speak about the creation. Normally, if you go to a Kiddush on a Yom Tif, we don't mention any part of the Torah, we'd start off. Baruch Atah Hashem Makinah Machalam blesses God that He gave us His Yom Tov and He chose us from the people the the the, 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 um, the, the festival of, Sha, of Rosh Hashanah whatever circus yeah. I, was about, yeah. I was about to say Yom Kippur right yeah. by the way there's a whole totally off that I reminded myself there's a whole halachic debate if somebody can't fast on Yom Kippur and he has to eat and he eats bread so you know in, you know in benching you have to fill in the holiday. So in the Siddur, the holiday, the Yom Kippur is called the day of our fasting Yom Kippur. Yom Tain, right? Yeah. Can you say that in mention? Well, the, if the hour that you're talking about is... Yeah, so the question is, is the benching based on you individually or based on the Jewish community? Yes. Yom Kippur is for everybody. There's the debate. That's a debate. Anyway, it's an interesting debate, no? Yeah. I solved the problem. Just don't eat bread. Some people, some, some people have to eat. Have a potato. Well, it brings up a good point because I will be one of those people this year. Okay. All right. All right. So, so, anyway, so, so, the, so the idea is we say, we see text number eight, we say it in Siddur. Hashem commands, Hashem in his goodness creates the world constantly. So, Shabbos is meant to remind us that we're not in control. Because six days a week we get we get overwhelmed and we and we lose focus. We think we're in control. Come Shabbos and it's a reset. That's that's Shabbos. Amalek is the polar opposite. What's Amalek? Like we said earlier, you know, and, and the um, and the third Chabad Rebbe, he's also called Reb Nach Nachmanel. But usually, in order to differentiate between the, our Rebbe and the Tzemach Tzedek, he's uh, our Rebbe is called the Rebbe. And he's called Reb Nachmanel of Lubavitch, or by his Best known book, the Tzemach Tzedek. So, this is the quote number nine, is not from our Rebbe. I see over here in the biography on the side. Right. It's 1789 to 1866. Um, so, he says like this Amalek has a different attitude. Astasia is a blessed memory described him as one who knows his master and deliberately re rebelled. This is from the Sifra. Amalek was impudent. He did not lack knowledge of God, like, for example, Pari. On the contrary, he knew and recognized Hashem's greatness. Nevertheless, he refused to be intimidated. His impudence and audacity drove him to reject Hashem without reason or justification. Like even the people who know they are inferior stand up brazenly to, to powerful or righteous people. I mean, we've all seen these type of people. They know they're idiots. They know they're wrong. Nah, I'm going to do it anyway. Sounds familiar. Be quiet. Shut up. <laughs> Sit down. So, How are you doing, Mom? So, so Amalek, so Amalek is, uh, that's a problem with Amalek. <coughs> Such a person, you can't get through. What are you going to talk to him about? He knows already. And, and, and he chooses to rebel. Not because he thinks he can. It's one thing to pick a fight when you think you might, uh, like Pare in the beginning, Moshe came and made the, uh, 
put, made the staff into a snake, right? So he said, yeah, my guys can do that also. Change water to blood. My guys can do that also. Pari really thought that this is a fight. You can win. Because remember, the Egyptians believed in multiple gods also. The sun god, the river god, the sheep god, this and that. Okay, you're good. So we'll, you know, we'll do... Moisture's trying to get through to Pari. No, no, no. There's only one god. And he's, a, and, he, and he's in control of everything. So it took a while, but Pari... You know, he, he, he got through. You know, some, some, sometimes, some students, they teach us at once. But Pari had to say it ten times. Right. Moshe was a good teacher. He had good methods of, teach, of teaching also. Right. Amalek, the, uh, Amalek, there's no one, um, the Amalek, uh, no one to get through. And like you see, there's an article over here. Um, this is, uh, who is this by? Dust and ashes, wiping out Amalek. Uh, this, is, this is Yad Vashem. This is an article. A, a good Israel underground newspaper. I, oh, I guess maybe this was, was this printed, I think, at the time of the Holocaust. He says, Haman and Amalek are targeting the Jews less as a people, as a, as a, as a divine people. Therefore, the war is directly, is mainly against the God of Israel. You can't fight God. God is invisible. So you fight his representative. Who's his representative? The Jewish people. They are uncomfortable. They, they, they object to his Torah. They are uncomfortable with a God who sees and demands um, and accounting for wrongdoing, these things are not only are not to Amalekites' liking. They want they don't want them. They therefore wish to destroy the Jewish people who stand in perfect faith. This is why God's name and, and throne cannot be complete as long as Amalek um, is around. So that's what the, the, I think was uh, 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 Hitler was rumored to have said. The Jewish people introduced two things into society which had to be eradicated: circumcision and a conscience. It was either Hitler or some other anti-Semite that said that. You know, you just like you know, Mark Twain said all the good things. Hitler said all the bad, right? Can we go back to that last line? Which one? This is why God's name and throne cannot be complete. That, as he's long quoting. As. He's quoting a line from Exodus. Hashem tells after a Molech attacks the Jewish people, Hashem tells Moshe to remember to wipe out a Molech because my name is incomplete. My name, my name is incomplete as long as Amalek is around. Because they, they don't just, they're not people that are unaware. They're aware and they do it anyway. They, they stand as a total antithesis to, uh, to me. As long as long, town ain't big enough for the two of us. So as long as they're here, I got a problem. Okay. Right? Okay, so now, so now we can understand so now we can understand the Jewish people's problem. I want us to remember Shabbos. God's all powerful. And you want us to remember a Molik? Like how he fights God. Uh, which one is it? Now you understand the question. But why do they chose these two remembrances to bring to Moses as a question? The Molik stands for fighting against God. In, or sort of independence from God. God has an opinion, I know, but I'll do my thing anyway. And and Shabbos stands for Hashem is absolute control. So let's go. So now we've got the Moshe's answer. Any questions yet before we... Uh, no? Right. So Larry, like Larry mentioned earlier, wine and vinegar actually have the same source. What's vinegar? Fermented wine. Fermented wine? Yeah. Wine that's fermented way too long. Right. No, not quite. It's wine that has been fermented because of the addition of an additional uh, catalyst. So if you look bacteria. at if you look at text number eleven B, it explains what how how look at text eleven B, explains exactly how it uh, how it happens. It's all exposed to oxygen and bacteria. I don't know. I just buy it from Publix. <laughs> I told Cyril, I mentioned I told Cyril, I need vinegar. Okay, leave the wine on the counter. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, patience, vinegar. patience, right? So, Actually, you have to see, if you want, really want vinegar, you have to seed it to make it vinegar. So what Moshe is trying to say over here, what Moshe is trying to say over here is like this. Wine is juice. Vinegar is juice, with a, but acidic juice. In, fa in fact, vinegar. The word, the root of the word vinegar is vine, wine, um, and and, um, and the second part of the word is acid. I think in 
um, vinaigrette, like uh, vinaigrette is, is a means acidic. So Shabbos is juice. Vinegar is juice with acid. That means like this. What Moshe is trying to say is, you know what your problem is, people? You think that there's two different sources here. Everything comes from the same place. Everything, Shabbos and and, and Amalek, all come from the, the same place. Look at text number twelve. There, there, it works like this. Text one, uh, page one twenty one. Ever writes like, says, when we when we examine the concept of Amalek from the perspective of Jewish mysticism, we discover that Amalek, represented by vinegar, is also rooted in holiness. How can anything deliberately rebel against God if there's nothing beside Him? It's only possible because there's nothing that God can do. Let's let's explore this. Many times when we think about God as the Almighty, all capable, we think about He can split the sea, He can make water come from a rock, bread come from heaven, whatever, whatever it is. But usually we we attach it to material things. But we, many people struggle with the good and bad thing. That God, that God in his, in his ability has. So, close back. Let me ask you a stupid question. If God wanted, could two plus two equal five? Yeah. Sure. sure. I mean, the answer doesn't make sense because two plus two is four. But if you want it, it'll be five. It means rebellion doesn't show that God doesn't exist. Let, let's go to subject for a second. God, I'm trying to think of a way to, a story to... Moshe comes to, to the burning bush. And Moshe asks God, where are you? Where are you and the Jewish people suffering? And God answers, I will be with them in the light, and I'll be with them in the darkness. Moshe's question is the question human beings have. When people are suffering, or when evil, it's an absence of God. God says, no, that's not, that's not true. I'm, I'm there in, in the good, I'm there in the Shabbos, and I'm there in the Malagosa. That means the, 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 the possibility or the, or the rebellion against, uh, against God isn't lack of godliness. That comes from, that comes from God too. Yeah. Or like you, would, uh, like you were saying. To prove that godliness exists in Shabbos, that's easy. But to, to prove the godliness... In, let, let's get capitalistic for a second, okay? Kabbalah talks about why Hashem sends the, send the neshama down to this world. Over there, it's good. When the neshama leaves here, what happens? It goes back up. Good. So what's the point of? What's the point of this? Well, like Jerry Seinfeld's joke about the horse racing. You know, the horses come back at the starting line. I'm like, who was just here? <laughs> because they stayed here the whole time, right? So why? What's the purpose of just going around in a circle? You come back to the same place. So we can do mitzvahs. But right. the purpose of the mitzvah, Kabbalah explained, is that light is appreciated more after experiencing darkness. When, when, when you're all experiencing Shabbos, the lack thereof doesn't, doesn't mean anything. It loses its... Or it, you know, it does mean something, but it's, it's a lot greater, a lot more precious to, to be able to realize the godliness even when it seems like he's not there. That's, uh, that's unique. So the Amalek, or the vinegar, gives us the possibility to ex experience godliness even in a place where we think godliness doesn't exist. So, but so how do we experience godliness in such a realm, the Amalek? You get rid of it. The Amalek stands as an opposition to godliness. And we get rid of him. And, and, and then we see it. So, so take it, take it to um, a, a, a broader, which we've covered before. The fact that the land of Israel is a holy land and Jewish land, very good. Why did Hashem kick us out of the out of the land of Israel? It's not just for punishment, because that God is in the holy land is obvious. Everybody knows. It's one of the most visited places in, in the world. Everyone goes. You know, I, I remember as a kid. I think I went for my bar mitzvah. First, yeah, it was my first time there. My bar mitzvah. I thought, who goes to Israel? It's stupid, you know, some stupid kid, you know, from Brooklyn, closed, you know, in my little world. Who goes to Israel? Jews. Right. 
Jews go to Israel. They go there, I see. Christians cross is I'm like, what are they doing in my country? <laughs> Why are you coming here? You got the whole world. Leave the country for me. So I'll explain to me that, that it's not only the Jews that realize the land of Israel is special. The whole world realizes the land of Israel is special. But to, to go to a person and say that God is, is present in the land of Israel, thank you. What about a Bangkok? God's there too. Ah, there's idolatry in Bangkok. Okay, so get rid of it, and then people will see the God's is there. Did they rescue those kids, by the way? Yes, they did. All of them? Yep. Oh, thank God. Okay. What Good. are we talking about? There was a gondola going across a gorge to, that ferries teachers and students to a school, and it's in a part of Pakistan where there's no roads or anything. So they used this gondola, and one of the lines snapped. You didn't see it on the news today? It was all over the radio. Where have you yeah. been? Living on the rock? News. Actually, I didn't see any news in the several days. No, I, I heard about it on the, I heard about it on the you, radio. Was that with Italian news? No. Anyway. I don't know. Yes, and, by, and by C, I mean, I didn't listen to any podcasts today, so. In the car. Uh, you, uh, all right. So, so it's interesting. The vinegar seems very bad. But even, even in the, even in the, in Talmudic text, we find different texts about vinegar. On one hand, if you see text 13a, vinegar is good. It, you get a whiff of it, <laughs> as a kick, restores his soul. On the other hand, when the, when the Gemara talks about, in, in, in um, this is a, it's quote 13b, is a quote from, um, is a quote from a Shulchan Aruch. When you want to give a, a, an example of something that goes bad, because on wine, you make a prayer at often. What bracha would you make if you decide to drink vinegar? You don't make very prayer often anymore. The wine's gone bad. Now you make a shahakal. Right? Because it's not wine anymore. It's, got, it, 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 it's gone bad. So, so, but so. Vinegar is not always bad. You, you right. put vinegar on a salad with a little bit of oil. I didn't say vinegar is bad. But what's yeah. vinegar? Vinegar is wine that's gone bad. You can't make a boyer priya guffin on, on vinegar. You can't make kiddish on vinegar. Okay, but let's change that. I didn't say, when you're, when you're coming, vinegar is absolutely bad. Absolute bad, it has no good to it. I didn't say that. But it's not. But it hasn't gone bad either. It's changed. Okay. It's changed. But it's changed. It came to a different form. Right. And which is also why you can't give the other blood. You have to change the blessing. I'm not saying that. I might, no, I, I, no, might vinegar, I, 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 I might see vinegar. I might see vinegar minayayin. Yeah. Well, yeah. This is, this he who makes uh, vinegar from wine. No, that's, that's a good blessing. No, no. Yeah. When, when, when vinegar goes bad, does it turn to wine? <laughs> it goes from brand. It goes. It goes from brand name vinegar. Then it goes to Walmart. And generic. You know. Then it all depends. Okay. And then you use Obvious. it for laundry. Exactly. And don't forget, there's brandy. Does brandy turn to vinegar? I have no idea. Um, he, I'm, I'm not the house expert on alcohol. So, so, um, so we have over here. I know. Just on one hand, if you're thirsty, you know, after Yom Kippur, let's not drink. After you know, don't drink vinegar. Other hand, vinegar has the power to uplift you. So, so this is so this is what um, this is what the Rebbe says. Chassidus says is a molik. On one hand. A Molech is, is rooted in God. God put, God put it here in order for us to negate it. There's certain things in life we're here in order for us to negate. That's why we're here. For us to get rid of. Get rid of. Put aside. Not everything has to be utilized. Some things have to be put away. Like half the junk in my house. <laughs> I, I would up that number. <laughs> Remember... Two days after you throw it away, you're going to find a need for it. So you shouldn't said, throw it away. Give it to me and stuff. I right. said half the junk. The other half the junk. So this is, um, this is now. The problem with vinegar, it's, it's acidic and, and painful. So there's, so the, the, let's look at what the, what the Rebbe says. Text 14. How the Rebbe puts it into words. Where are we? Uh, look at that. He says, it, it, it is what Moshe Rabbeinu is telling the Jewish people. A cup of wine cannot be compared to a cup of vinegar. Shabbos and Amalek are both cups through which we are filled with the revelation of sacred godliness because Amalek is also rooted in that holiness. Your, your whole problem was, your question was based on a, an idea that's false. The, the, basically the common mistake that evil exists outside the purview of God. No. 
The Molik is rooted in godliness too. However, the two cups are not equal. Just because a Molik is rooted in godliness doesn't make it good. It makes it present. The Shabbos cup is for us to utilize and to, to observe and to sanctify. While the Molik cup urges us to punish. By remembering Shabbos, remember Hashem's omnipresence on earth. Remembering a Molik doesn't reveal Hashem's presence on earth. Only when we punish a Molik, question and blurry. So the mitzvah, by the way, to remember a Molik isn't to remember that the story once happened. The mitzvah to remember Amalek is to, remember, to get rid of Amalek, to actively get rid of it. Why? Because it, because it stands against everything that's good. And when you do that, you're lifting up the good, because you're actively removing what's bad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's not just remembering that evil exists. It's being an active participant to get rid of it. So automatic, why are you doing it? Because, you know, you know why, why do people, why do people go to war against against Nazi Germany, or against uh, or against communists, whatever it is, to get rid of the evil? That's why we do it. So automatically, I mean, you should at least. The feelings of, uh, of morality or or you know, the actions should be based on this. You always have to remember why we're here. And the, uh, thus, vinegar is an apt metaphor for Amalek. When we obliter obliterate Amalek, a cup of vinegar is revealed as a medium that restores and vitalizes the soul. This is because remembering to destroy Amalek demonstrates that Amalek existence derives exclusively from Hashem's unlimited omnipresence. It's, it's because Hashem has the ability, or to, to use Hasidic terms, in Hashem's ability to be infinite is the ability to be finite. In Hashem's unlimited ability is his ability to produce good and bad. If it wasn't, then we wouldn't have, then he wouldn't be unlimited, he wouldn't be almighty. So, so when we crush Amali, we're recognizing Hashem's un unlimited ability. Does that click? It's kind of it's kind of what's called uh, in in Jewish learning shlila. It's you go about it through the back door. We don't say directly, we infer it. So, all right. So why does so why does evil exist? Why are we wasting our time? We're not wasting our time. The whole the whole premise of the question is wrong. When you when you are fighting evil, when you when you're dealing with it and you're putting it aside, what you're actually doing is you're you're making the world a more godly place. Why are you acting this way? To God, because Hashem asked you to, and, and unlike them. That that idea that I can do what I want and I can hurt who I want because I feel like it. No, you're you're combating that. Why? Because there's an all-seeing guy. Because Hashem wants us to act in a certain way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, let's get to the key the key, uh, the key points. All right. To remember something in its truest sense is to relive the emotional experience with whether remember, trauma or joy. It's not just you know to write it down to remember. Like an Asia anniversary, do you just remember it, or or, or you were happy? What? <laughs> Is it just an event anniversary, or you actually oh you're, you're happy that? Uh, I don't know. You don't know. Huh? We've been together so long. Who even thinks about it anymore? <laughs> exactly. Thinks about what? <laughs> there well, you go. Fifty-eight years, and how long? How long were you? How long were you um, dating before the wedding? Four years. Four years. So it's really sixty-two years. That ain't bad. Not bad. I don't know. That's, that's a long time. <laughs> Remembering Shabbos. But if you don't know any better, it doesn't feel like. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Manus Friedman has this. I don't know. It's a joke. It's not a joke. If you go to older people, and, and you ask them, "Why do you love each other?" They don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it was her ability to play the flute. <laughs> That's her, right. Her, her, her music enchanted me. Exactly. Oh, yeah. And her cooking. Oh, like a right, Barbara, and cooking. Yeah, but what did I play? The sousaphone, the tuba. Tuba. Seriously? Yeah. Remembering okay. Shabbos entails that, that living inside the moment of creation. Remembering a Amalek includes living inside the rebellion of God. The two can only be re, uh, relived simultaneously. Uh, because both communicate the same point. Shabbos declares that Hashem is a, is a true master, who is omnipotent and omnipresent. Molech declares that Hashem is omnipresent even in the face of evil. 
There is no place aside um, that, that is void of him. No place void from him, including places that are bad. Remembering Amalek is not enough. You must remember to fight Amalek until he is crushed. Only then is the full scope of Hashem's uh, omnipresence revealed. Evil exists only to demonstrate Hashem's omnipresence in the face of evil, which is why we fight evil wherever we find it and why we can always overcome. Being that this is a story about, uh, this is a class about evil and and testament, let me end up with a story. This uh, this story happens in I think uh, late 1900s, early 1900s, late 1800s. This story is with the family. Uh, his, uh, his last name was Patil. The first name, I don't remember. They lived in the town. And the guy was a logger. He lived at the edge of the forest. Right? That was his. That was his, that was his business. And. And he was a chassid of the fifth Chabad Rebbe, the Shalom Dever. Now the head of the town was an anti-Semite. I can't remember his name. It, it wasn't Shalom, it, it was some Ruski, you know, some Ruski name. So, the, so this guy, this, this Baltiel, his son was learning by the, by the, by the, by the, Rebbe, by the Rebbe, Nishir. So he wanted to make an addition to the house. So the you know, before he embarks on a, an adventure, he asked, he asked the Rebbe for a blessing. He said, yeah, it should be with blessing and success. Now, this, this uh, head of the town, this Russian anti-Semite, wanted to make problems, problems with the Jew. And he came and he passed a law that you can't build without, without a permit. Now, now it's normal. But 120 something years ago, he did whatever he wanted. And, and because of that, he, su he, summoned, he summoned the... Uh, he summoned the Jew to, to, to a hearing, and he was going to be in a lot of trouble, and he could take away his business, and take away his money, and take away his house, because he didn't get a permit. I, he only passed the law after he started, but the chassid was all nervous. So what's, uh, what does he do? He writes a letter to the Rebbe. The Rebbe writes, writes back to him, says, don't be intimidated by evil. You go ahead and build your house, and everything will be okay. So when the Rebbe gives a blessing like that, you continue building the house. So you can imagine how infuriated the head of the Russian was, the head, the head of the town, that this guy was continuing to build his house. You're going to see when we're going to bring you in front of the committee, you're going to lose everything. Anyway, so, so this was, I guess, late, it was late 1800s. So the trains in Russia were relatively still a novelty. So the guy's daughter would go to the train station just to watch the trains, you know, go back. So this guy, this Russian head of the town, was, was by the was by the was by the platform. He was taking a train somewhere, and everyone the train came, and everyone was waiting to get on get on the train. I mean, he wanted to show that he is a he's a macher. A macher means he's a big shot. He doesn't have to get on the train with everyone else. He was talking with the station master, whatever it is, and then when they go, doot, doot, the train started to go. You know, it's first to go slowly. He would ascend at the last second because he's. Yeah, Hattie Tootie. What happened was he was wearing a long cloak and had fancy buttons and trails, whatever it is. He got onto the bottom step, but his his cloak got caught into the into the uh, into the spokes of the train wheel, and it pulled him down. And no more big macha. No more big macha. And the girl came home and told her father, <clears throat> "Er is nish do. Er is nish do. He's not here. He's not here. He's gone." That's a lesson for every person. Who tries to go up against the Jewish people? At first, you might be successful, but at the end, niz do, because the the Saini Yisrael will never succeed. Because I'm Yisrael Chai. All right, everybody. All right. See you next week.